and then Security Now. When I taught a previous operating systems course, EC254, after the introduction, we spent some time talking about the history of operating systems, you know, what qualifies as the first generation of operating systems, and uh, what's the third, and uh, where do modern operating systems fit in this generation scheme, uh, and all of that. Um, and while some understanding of the history of the thing might be helpful in explaining some design decisions, the discussion was too vague and too high level to be useful. Um, it just ended up being, oh, hey, here's some random trivia. Uh, and that didn't really make sense, right? It's not a good use of time. Um, it's much better if we focus on something useful. And in this case, we're going to talk about security. Um, I really do not like you know, trivia based exam questions. I'll just you know, memorize these random facts about you know, what qualifies as a second to your operating system like that. That's silly. But security. That's interesting. Um, but we're also going to talk about, well, protection. In fact, we're going to talk about that more than we're going to talk about security. But let's just get into that. So in many textbooks, security and protection are subjects sort of left to the end. Um, I don't think that's a great plan, actually. Security is something you want to bake into your design and something you want to have in your mind constantly. It doesn't really work to try to bolt it on afterwards. Um, as we go through the topics of the course, we're not going to stop at every uh, opportunity and consider the security implementations or the risks of every possible decision, but it is still something that you should think about and it is something you should have in your mind. Thinking about security from you know, early on helps you to make good design decisions uh, and recognize uh, potential problems earlier than if you realize it only after you've had to disclose the bad news about some security breach. Now, an operating system is designed to support multiple users concurrently, uh, each of whom is potentially running multiple programs concurrently. And then there are the operating systems processes itself, which are not really under the user's control. Even if you're the only user on your system, the operating system wants to enforce certain rules so that malicious programs or even just malicious websites can't steal your personal data or otherwise sabotage the system. Um, Real-time operating systems, incidentally, are less likely than others to support the idea of multiple users concurrently. Um, industrial machinery to assemble a tank doesn't really have user accounts and configurations the way that a server running Ubuntu might. Um, but nevertheless, uh, that kind of system can still have multiple processes, so it's still valuable to consider this sort of thing. Um, and typically, operating system designers create some policies and also policy tools. Uh, and some policies are just part of the operating system and cannot be changed. Um, a file must have the execute permission in Unix to run. This is a system policy and there's no option in the menu to turn that off. Others are configurable. Uh, can a non-administrator user install new programs on the system? Sometimes that's fine and sometimes you do not want that at all. Um, security policies have trade-offs, um, and the trade-off is with usability, right? Um, it can be very frustrating for users who are denied permission to do some operation, and they have to go ask an administrator to do it for them. Um, but on the other hand, you can't be too lax about this, because you most certainly do not want to find your company's name on TV having to report a data breach in which a bunch of user personal data was stolen. Uh, and yeah, as the, as the graphic suggests, the security budget before a data breach is very different from the security budget after a data breach, right? Um, and the operating system must enforce whatever policies, whether they're the configured ones or built-in ones, whatever they are, the operating system has to enforce them. Uh, if security policies are not enforced, um, then, well, malicious users will be able to exploit the system, and you do not want that. If we do this well, um, we provide uh, three desirable properties, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Goes by the acronym CIA. Uh, no, no particular um, relation to any uh, government agencies using similar acronym. Operating systems that don't do this um, will inevitably be exploited by malicious users and people just won't want to use them anymore, right? Uh, if the company, if the product gets a bad reputation for security, people will want to switch to a more secure alternative. They might not be able to do so immediately, but you can see why they would consider it to be important. So whatever the specifics are, we'll talk about these uh, three things, confidentiality, integrity, 
availability. Confidentiality is that information should only be accessed by those who are authorized to see it. Integrity is that information should be consistent and correct. Uh, and availability is that information or services should be available when they are needed. Now, I've said security at this point, but actually a lot of our discussion is really about protection instead. Um, and protection is about internal threats. That is making sure that user Morgan cannot access the private files of user Taylor. Um, security is more about external threats, things like making sure that evil hackers don't gain access to the system. And we'll actually talk about these things in that order, protection, then security. Okay, protection is a third level abjuration spell with casting time of one action. Oh, oh no, I'm going to get sued by Wizards of the Coast here, aren't I? Um, this should fall under the open game license, but um, uh, yeah, if you followed any of the drama around that uh, earlier in, uh, in 2023, you might know why it might not be a good idea for me to use this. Huh? I'll take my chances. Okay, no, um, that's not the kind of protection that we are actually going to, to talk about. Um, most of the discussion in this course is really based around the idea of protection, which is how does the design of the operating system ensure that the rules are followed? Following the rules is important to have um, an actually functioning system and without it, anarchy results. Uh, as much as we'd all like to live in a world where everybody is nice and nobody does anything wrong, um, have you seen the news recently? Even if you did have a system where all the legitimate users lack malicious intent, it would certainly be possible for somebody to disrupt the system uh, and disrupt the experience of others by accident. And that sometimes happens on you know, the ECE Ubuntu servers where somebody um, unintentionally writes a program that exhausts shared memory or gets into an infinite loop uh, and uses excessive CPU time. We don't like that, we don't want that. Um, malicious intent is not present. I don't think, but it still uh, requires, well, the um, protection rules to prevent uh, an overly negative experience for other users of the system. So the goals of protection, in short, it's about enforcing the policies around responsible resource usage. What is reasonable and responsible varies across many different systems. Some servers are dedicated to running exactly one service and there's nothing wrong with them uh, using up 100% of the CPU for that service, um, and that's okay. Other servers like the ECU Ubuntu systems are meant to be shared amongst hundreds and hundreds of students, any of whom could be working on different courses at different times, so resources there need to be shared. It would not be okay for one process to be taking up 50% of uh, all available CPU time. That doesn't really work. Uh, an obvious case of access control that's important is permissions on files. There's many files on a shared system, but not all of them are yours. Some of them belong to you, yes, and some of them belong to other users, and yet others belong to the operating system itself. And you wouldn't want to do your assignment on a shared server if that server had no enforcement of ownership. Uh, it would be all too easy for somebody to copy your code or delete it to sabotage you. Um, Another idea, uh, operating system enforce logical walls between processes. Um, as we go through the course, we'll see a few examples. Uh, for one, the memory of a given program is not accessible to other programs. Rules, however, take effort to enforce. Uh, every request or action has to be checked by the operating system um, to make sure that it is valid. Uh, valid in this case, meaning in compliance with the rules. With that said, there are exceptions and administrators can override some, but probably not all, policies. And these policies, even if they're you know, operating system defined, sometimes administrators can change them. Um, you can make a file public so that you would intentionally allow others to access it. You can ask your program to access shared memory so that another program can share the same segment of memory as we've seen. Um, and administrators can do things like read files that belong to somebody else. You can see why we need a lot of trust in our administrators. Other kinds of rules can exist other than these sort of access control rules, even though those are the most common ones. One potential idea is you could terminate processes that use too much CPU or memory. Those are probably fairly rare in the real world, but it is a, it is a possibility. While there's probably no good reasons for users to read one another's data, at least without permission, there are frequently good reasons for using a lot of resources. 
let's imagine for a minute that I want to edit a lecture video. I mean, you should imagine this is a perfectly legitimate use of the system, right? Uh, if I am editing a lecture video, I'm not doing anything malicious. It is for a valid work-related purpose, right? It is literally part of my uh, employment at the university to edit uh, videos so that you can use them for your learning. And if I do edit it though, it consumes a lot of CPU and RAM. Is that bad? I don't think so. Um, it's a legitimate use, but it might set off alarms if we just considered the CPU usage and the memory usage in isolation. This does mean that we can't be super strict about the rule, right? If uh, my process was terminated every time I tried to edit a video, I would say this is a bad policy because editing a video is a legitimate part of my job. But because there is this lack of strictness, um, it does give an opening to malicious users. They could make excessive requests um, and they could overwhelm the system. When we talk about scheduling algorithms, we'll see how a real system will do its best to make sure that even if a user is requesting excessive CPU time, it won't impact others too much. If that's not enough, there is always the option to uh, escalate to system administrators who can potentially do something about it. This brief introduction hopefully makes clear the importance of protection when we consider how file system shared memory and others work to prevent internal problems, but we should also consider external factors.